San Francisco this weekend in conjunction with one of the city's most influential and least known historic personalities. The place is Sutro Heights Park, out by the Cliff House, where workers are putting on the finishing touches on the restored well house that was once part of the magnificent estate of former San Francisco Mayor Adolf Sutro. Exactly 100 years ago, Sutro opened his beautifully landscaped grounds to the public. He had a new vision for San Francisco, a precise plan that dramatically changed the look of the city. Tonight we have a special Friday focus report from Channel 7's Paul Jeske that begins with the edge of the empire. Adolf Sutro anchored his real estate empire on the spectacular northwest corner of San Francisco, here where the pounding Pacific crashes ashore beneath towering cliffs and boulder-strewn beaches, the waves echoing among the century-old ruins of the Cliff House, Sutro Baths, Land's End, and Sutro Heights. Amazingly, almost all this tinkering with nature is the work of one individual, an iron-willed businessman, politician, and social engineer by the name of Adolf Sutro. Even though he once owned one-twelfth of the land that is now San Francisco and probably did more to shape the growth of the city than any other individual, the name Adolf Sutro is hardly a household word in the city by the Golden Gate. Sutro was born in Germany in 1830 and came to the United States with his mother and 12 brothers and sisters just about the time the 49ers were discovering gold in California. He made a few dollars as a cigar importer in Boomtown, San Francisco, then headed for Virginia City, Nevada, and the famous Comstock Lode, where the gold bonanza created instant millionaires. Sutro's contribution to the incredibly chaotic and independent mining business was the Sutro Tunnel, an amazingly ambitious scheme to tunnel all the way from the proposed town of Sutro straight through the mountain to Virginia City and the dozens of mines that penetrated one of the richest concentrations of gold and silver in the world. The idea was to drain off the millions of gallons of water that regularly flooded the shafts, to ventilate them from the tremendous heat that built up inside, and to provide the miners with an easier way to get their ore to the smelter. Sutro waged a one-man crusade to get his tunnel built. He personally set off dynamite blasts and led the tunnel diggers, his own pick swinging ahead of him. He had to fight floods, avalanches, mudslides, and poisonous gases that made the air almost unbreathable. But Sutro's amazing $5 million project was a success. Virginia City is about four miles from here, on the other side of Rose Peak, about 2,000 feet higher than we are now. Tunnel workers used to party in Virginia City, and then they'd use the tunnel as a shortcut home. They'd take an elevator ride down a mine shaft, about 1,800 feet to the tunnel level, and then they'd walk down the gradual slope about four miles back here to Sutro. The Sutro Tunnel Company is still around, although it's now known officially as the Comstock Tunnel and Drainage Company. Jim Shriver runs the outfit today, and he's still impressed with the tunnel as an engineering feat. It was known for its engineering precision. Apparently, Sutro was that kind of a person. He, did, he required a precise solution to everything. So the tunnel is absolutely straight, almost four miles long. Uh, it has uh, uh, three, uh, four, excuse me, four ventilation shafts in it. Uh, and it was graded exactly one foot for every thousand feet, which was rather unusual in those days to go to that much precision. The, the tunnel was never a money maker. It supported itself for uh, over 50 years. Uh, however, it never made a profit, never paid a dividend, so far as I know. If he was poor, he certainly didn't live that way. Sutro entertained lavishly in this mansion and sold out his tunnel stock and headed back to San Francisco in 1880 with close to a million dollars in cash. Within a couple of years of his arrival back in San Francisco, Sutro began creating what many people believe was his most elaborate and successful project, an enchanted estate high up on the bluff overlooking the western entrance to San Francisco Bay. Sutro picked up this piece of real estate from a saloon keeper who parted with a house and 21 acres of barren sand dunes for a grand total of $15,000. Sutro immediately hired gardeners to plant the hilltop with trees, flower beds, lawns, shrubbery, and walkways. And 100 years ago, in 1886, he invited the public in to stroll through his magnificent estate and enjoy the works of art absolutely free of charge. While time has not been entirely kind to Adolf Sutro's magnificent garden at the Heights, the National Park Service, which is in charge of the area today, is trying hard to recapture some of the grandeur of the past. 
A visitor uh, coming to Sutro Heights in about 1895 would have found an, uh, an eclectic Victorian garden filled with all types of flowers and plants, examples of statuary ranging from um, Greek gods and goddesses to, to, to fauns, centaurs, um, classical um, heroes, um, philosophers, poets, and um, beasts of mythology such as the griffin. Carpet beds laid out um, in, in flowery patterns spelling out welcome on Sutro Heights, um, draperies of flowers, um, ornately sculpted hedges, and in a, a range of animals. Sutro kept uh, live fawn, kept eagles, monkeys, all tethered, and, and um, in some cases allowed them to wander about the grounds. It was a Victorian wonderland. It wasn't just art that fascinated Sutro. He had one of the largest private collections of books and manuscripts in the world, and he planned to build a library on Sutro Heights for the benefit of scholars and students of San Francisco. Sutro went to Europe and bought out entire libraries. Most of Sutro's collection of more than a quarter million books and pamphlets were destroyed by the 06 earthquake and fire which roared through the downtown warehouse in which they were stored. What's left of the collection is here at the state-owned Sutro Library behind the Stonestown Shopping Center. They came by two railroads to wonder at what Sutro had created out of the sand dunes of western San Francisco. Among the visitors were President Benjamin Harrison, William Jennings Bryan, Andrew Carnegie, and Oscar Wilde. Many of them arrived on Sutro's own railroad, a transportation system that ran through one of the most ruggedly beautiful pieces of the California coast. Imagine what it must have been like traveling by cable car and steam train all the way from downtown San Francisco to 48th and Point Lobos for exactly a nickel, a fare Sutro successfully fought to keep when the Southern Pacific Company doubled prices to a dime on its rival route. Sutro's Cliff House and Ferries Railroad ran right through Land's End, a coastal route that provided spectacular views of Golden Gate scenery when it wasn't shut down by frequent slides in the geologically unstable area. Admission to the Heights was free to riders of Sutro's Railroad, but he wasn't entirely altruistic. The businessman had a grand scheme to entertain his guests at a profit at his nearby Cliff House and Sutro Baths properties. National Park historians believe that many statues from Sutro's estate ended up in private gardens. If you have a piece that you might want to donate to the GGNRA, they'd love to hear from you. The public would be happy to take a look at him. Well, we're not true. Coming up next on our Friday Focus on Adolf Sutro, some amazing old views of the Sutro baths and the cliff house the way it was. That's next. Stay tuned. Historians researching the history of the western edge of San Francisco tell us that it was always a kind of rowdy place. And tonight, as our Friday Focus report on Adolf Sutro continues, we take a close-up look at some of the earliest images and recollections of San Francisco's playground. San Franciscans have been going to the Cliff House in one or another of its reincarnations since the 1850s. The first Cliff House was a fashionable seaside resort where the Crockers, Stanfords, Hearsts, and other prominent San Francisco families came to admire the view of seal rocks through the telescope on the balcony or to enjoy a meal in the elegant dining room. And for the men, there was gambling. When Adolf Sutro bought the Cliff House in 1881, it had a rather unsavory reputation as a place where married San Francisco gentlemen brought their girlfriends. One of the first things Sutro did was have all the beds taken out of the rooms and the locks taken off all the doors. Sutro wanted to attract families to the Cliff House area. He loved the sea lions that played on the offshore rocks and in 1887, he talked Congress into turning seal rocks over to San Francisco as a permanent preserve. Sutro was forever remodeling his cliff house, but on Christmas Day, 1894, a raging fire swept through the building and destroyed its collection of valuable seashells, rare coins, and a guest register with the signatures of three presidents. Out of the ashes rose the most spectacular building ever seen on the western edge of San Francisco, this Victorian fantasy was bolted to the rocks with massive iron rods. The palatial palace was five stories high, complete with majestic spires and a tower that served as an observatory. There were dining rooms, parlors, art galleries, and of course, those spectacular views. Unfortunately, San Franciscans were only able to enjoy Sutro's gingerbread gem for 12 years. 
It caught fire and burned to the ground in 1907. And while the Cliff House has survived in various remodelings, nothing half as classy has ever again occupied that dramatic piece of shoreline. And perhaps nothing that Sutro has done was more controversial than the Sutro Baths, which 100 years ago were just beginning to take form north of the Cliff House. Up to 25,000 people a day came to the grandiose baths where they could enjoy six saltwater swimming tanks, all kept at different temperatures, and one freshwater plunge. It cost just a dime for admission and 25 cents for swimming. This is the way it looked in 1896 to a young photographer by the name of Thomas Edison. Another famous San Franciscan, photographer Ansel Adams, remembered the baths well, and he talked about them to University of California researchers shortly before his death. I think the earliest memory I have of baths is somewhere in the middle tens. I think I must have gone out as a kid of six to eight. My father taught me how to swim, and he, then he taught me how to dive, and that was fun. And, uh, then I nearly fell off the high diving uh, platform. I went up there to see what it looked like, and I stumbled. There wasn't any water in the tank, three feet below. I remember stumbling on the mat and falling down on my face and catching on the board. Adams survived that near miss, but the baths had difficulty. They lost money, and by 1937, Sutro's grandson covered the pools and turned them into an ice skating rink. By the late 1950s, the baths and its eclectic assortment of curios and collectibles were mostly out of fashion. But it did serve as a wonderful stage for the 1958 movie, The Lineup, which TV fans may remember as the pilot for a series called San Francisco Beat. The gray 57 Plymouth Sea Dad, part of Sutro's Museum. Occupants, males, one woman, and one child. A fitting the description. Inspector 32, we're rolling. By 1966, the baths were sold to land developers who wanted to put up a high-rise apartment on the site. Demolition had already begun when fire broke out and destroyed what was left of the building. Among the items that were moved out just two weeks before the fire, the famous Sutro Egyptian collection, including a mummy that dates back to about 2000 BC. Its new home is San Francisco State University. It's a triple nesting set. It's well preserved. The man is about 50 years old, and he had the same ailments we have today, arthritis and dental problems. One of the more bizarre pieces to come from the baths is this self-sculpture of a Japanese artist, which he decorated with his own hair, fingernails, toenails, and teeth. Appropriately enough, it now resides in Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum on Fisherman's Wharf. And that's something. San Francisco State University occasionally puts the Egyptian collection on public display, and you can contact the Classics Department for more information on that uh, whole thing. It's, what a collection, though. It's yeah, just so it's really fascinating to look into the past. Still to come on Channel 7 News as our Friday Focus report on Adolph Sutro continues. A look at how the Park Service plans to reflect and restore some of the beauty of the past and the changes in store for Sutro Height. Do we have... Um we're still doing this at the, the CHP float that we didn't do yet? History tells us that Adolf Sutro, the man who manicured the bluffs above the Roaring Pacific, demanded a precise engineering solution to almost every problem. In part three of our Friday Focus report tonight, reporter Paul Jeske takes a look at plans for what's left of Sutro's empire. Starting with his development of the heights, the baths, and the cliff house, 
Sutro built a real estate empire that eventually comprised virtually all the Richmond and Sunset districts, West Portal, Forest Hill, St. Francis Wood, Westwood Park, Parnassus Heights, Corona Heights, and Sutro Forest. He gave away a huge chunk of land to the University of California for a medical center just below the north side of Twin Peaks. Adolph Sutro had a grand vision for the western shore of San Francisco. Sutro envisioned that the outside lands which um, Sutro Heights are perched in, could become the veritable garden spot of San Francisco. No longer sand dunes or a, or a, a godforsaken wilderness, Sutro saw the outside lands as a place where folks could come out, homestead or stake a place to live, and then transform the sand wilderness into a green garden. Sutro Heights was more than just an experiment in public recreation. It was a demonstration by Adolf Sutro that the sand could be tamed. Coming out to see Sutro Heights, riding out on the ferries and Cliff House Railroad, seeing the, the great vista of the ocean, enjoying the public recreation, folks could then be inspired by the gardens of Sutro Heights, then perhaps come and plunk down their money for a lot of property in the, uh, in the outside lands, which of course Sutro owned. Ironically, while the so-called outside lands prospered, Sutro Heights itself fell on hard times following Sutro's death in 1898 after one term as mayor of San Francisco. His daughter Emma had trouble maintaining the palatial estate and shortly after her death in 1938, the city tore down the mansion and looked the other way while hooligans vandalized the gardens and carted away the statuary. With a little help from some newfound friends, Sutro Heights may once again soon recapture at least some of its grandeur. Sutro Heights will become less of a deteriorated and overgrown park. The open space character of Sutro Heights will be expanded and continued um, as we clear away the brush and the ruin of, of years of neglect. The remains of Sutro's Victorian dream, unfortunately, are a bit beyond our financial reach at this time, but we do hope to take some of these elements and bring them back to offer sort of a ghost or a glimpse or a trace of what was once here. The Park Service currently has no plan to rebuild Sutro Baths. What we'd like to do is, um, is make it a, a, a wonderful and wild setting, a place with the ambience of runes, um, sharply suggesting what was once there, but keeping it as a mysterious um, place. But there is a slight possibility that Sutro's Virginia City Tunnel could be put back into operation if gold and silver prices continue to increase. The tunnel would be a candidate for exploration purposes or even for uh, mine drainage, providing the Comstock mines were reopened at depth. But this would require a gold and silver price a great deal higher than presently exists. As for Adolf Sutro, shortly after the Golden Gate National Recreation Area acquired the land in the late 70s, officials made an amazing discovery. Cemented into the artificial rocks that helped stabilize the cliff beneath Sutro's parapet was a funeral urn that apparently contained Sutro's ashes. Historians believe his cremated remains were placed there by family members in compliance with his dying wish to be buried at Sutro Heights. Shortly after the Park Service found the urn, they took it to a funeral home for safekeeping. But a couple of days later, a gentleman showed up, claimed to be a Sutro relative, and claimed the urn for himself. That's the last anyone ever saw of the last remains of Adolf Sutro. In San Francisco, Paul Jeske, Channel 7 News. The spirit of Adolf Sutro will be on hand, however.